What's up, you guys? Welcome to the Katie Z. Sawyer podcast. I'm your host, Katie, and this is my first ever episode for this channel. Now, most episodes, you will be able to expect conversations with people I find absolutely fascinating. But today serves as little more of an introduction to the channel as a whole. A lot of people know me as a fisherman that enjoys hunting, but the reality of the situation is that I didn't grow up in the outdoor space like so many of my peers did. In fact, it wasn't until my 20s that I was ever even exposed to offshore fishing, much less hunting. So who am I? How did I get here? And what can you expect from this channel? Let's dive in. All right, so although I was not exposed to fishing and hunting until my 20s, I did grow up in an international family and was exposed to a lot of different things. I was born in France. My brothers and I were all born and raised there, at least until the 90s when we moved to South Texas and now call that home. I am Belgian-American. My dad was head of telecommunications for the Council of Europe. I speak two languages and have dual nationality, yes, French and English, and am luckily pretty conversationally fluent in Spanish as well, thanks to all the years I've spent in Spanish-speaking countries. So I grew up with a lot of international exposure, and today we are still pretty international. I have a brother in China, a brother in Paris, and a brother in California. We're pretty spread out, but I still call South Texas home. I went to Texas A&M University and got my undergraduate degree in natural resource management and conservation, as well as sustainability in international tourism. That's right. It's a mouthful. I studied in the Recreation, Parks, and Tourism Sciences Department, and I had a dream to be a park ranger. I found it absolutely fascinating that humans have become so separate from nature in our own minds when we are ancestrally part of nature. That's where we come from. So I really liked that mindset and really wanted to dive into it, although I didn't realize exactly how that would take me where I am today. Now, I got my master's degree in environmental science as well and am a published scientist. No, it's not in marine science, not even close, but I did do that schooling while also working full time for an oil and gas company in South Texas. I was the director of environmental health and safety there and worked that job for about two years before throwing my hands up in the air and saying, I'm not happy here. It's time for a change. Now, at the time, my boyfriend, Drake, who is now my husband, was fishing the Costa Rica circuit. And I ended up convincing the boss, the owner of the boat, that it was a good idea to have me on board cooking, cleaning, and provisioning, taking care of guest services, while also getting paid pretty much peanuts. I didn't care about the pay, you guys. I just wanted the life experience. And that's exactly what I got. But before we get into that, I want to say that I did a year of my master's in Brussels. That's actually where I started my environmental science master's program and had a bit of a hard time because it was such a long, cold winter. I visited Drake in Isla Mujeres. It was my first time ever in Mexico. This was back in 2012 and fell absolutely in love with it. He was there on the on location, a 57-foot Caps custom boat built out of Virginia Beach by Nelva Caps, and he was the mate at the time. I took two weeks to go there, ended up staying three, came back, quit my program, and moved back to Texas because I realized that I needed to be closer to the salt, the sea, and the sun, especially the sun. So I moved back to Texas, but before then, the owner of the boat actually invited me to do the crossing from Isla to Panama. Now, he had a goal and ambition to fish Tropic Star Lodge in Panama, Pacific Panama, with his own vessel. He had gone a handful of times to the lodge as a tourist and chartered boats there, but really wanted to get there on the on location. So the crew, a crew of three, took the boat from Isla all the way to the Pacific, and I joined. I was definitely not, (laughs) I was definitely just riding along. I was not a paid component of this crew by far. I knew nothing about it, but it was definitely an eye-opening experience because 
the Caribbean, I remember the Caribbean was real rough. And by the time we got to San Andres, I was just so, th- I could have kissed, I probably kissed the earth. I don't remember that specifically, but you guys, I was ready. But despite being miserable on that crossing, it was an incredible experience. I learned a lot about what it means to be living and traveling on a sport fishing boat. We went through the Panama Canal. We ended up in Panama City, and I even got to fish a couple trips up to Tropic Star Lodge. That in itself was an eye-opening experience. We were living on the boat with three full-grown men, and um, somehow I ended up back in that type of operation, so apparently at 23 years old, that didn't disturb me one bit. But then I had to face reality and move back to Texas to finish my master's program and get a full-time job. Now... The boat ended up, they were just supposed to be in Panama, and that's when Drake was getting all these crazy reports from the fad fishing industry of Costa Rica. He, I remember he told me this, this boat got 18 blue marlin releases in one day, and I was like, wow, that's crazy, but I didn't actually know how crazy that actually was. Um, he convinced the owner of the boat to go check it out. They went up to Golfito in Costa Rica, signed a three-month cruising permit that eventually ended up them <laughs> having them in Costa Rica for seven years. So fast forward back to the moment when I decided to quit my job because I was unhappy after two years of working in the oil and gas industry. I took the job as a stewardess on board the On Location. Now, I was more than just the stew on board. I was also helping with concierge and finance work. Because I went to university, I knew how to do a spreadsheet, so I was extremely helpful in keeping up with the receipts and the transactions and eventually formulating budgets for the boat. I also helped with any concierge work the owner and his guests needed. I was... I was scheduling taxis. I was making sure that passport information was sent to the right people. I was provisioning the condo and I was making sure that every guest was happy, including those that didn't want to go fishing and finding the right activities for them in Costa Rica. That's a pretty easy job to do just because there's so much option, but it was very, very busy. In fact, when we were offshore, those were kind of technically my easiest days by far. I wasn't running around like a chicken with its head cut off in the Costa Rican heat. Nope, I was just there to cook and clean, and I really enjoyed it. I didn't know what I was getting into when I got to Costa Rica, but I knew enough to know that I enjoyed being on the water. I'd only been on the water a handful of times, inclusive of the Panama Crossing. And when I say on the water, I mean offshore specifically. Recap, I was 25 years old. I didn't know what I wanted in life, but I did know what I didn't want. So I decided to just chase what made me happy, and the ocean made me happy. By the time I got to Costa Rica, Drake was running the boat. We were fishing 100-plus day seasons, sail fishing in the spring, and blue marlin bait and switch fishing, the fads in the summertime. It was an incredible experience for me because I got to watch a lot of people catch fish. I got to watch a lot of fish behind the spread. And I think most importantly, and the biggest learning experience, was I got to watch a lot of mistakes being made. I was on the boat for a couple years before I got to really step up and be an angler and develop my skills with a rod. Now, We developed a pretty good tournament team. I saw the ins and outs of what that took before I ever got the chance to step up. In fact, the only reason why I was given the opportunity to step up was because we were short one angler. There's a competitive tournament scene in Costa Rica. At the time, there was really just the one uh, three-series tournament, and we got really, really good. In fact, we we finished really well. There was a little bit of a, a... drama situation in which they felt like I should be considered a professional, even though we had in writing that the tournament committee had approved me as a non-professional beforehand, but we got disqualified and moved to a different harbor in Costa Rica. Costa Rica was an exceptional opportunity for me because I learned so much about fine-tuning the abilities as an angler in the cockpit. I was able to really differentiate between what fish are doing behind the spread and how to present your bait in the best possible way. I also learned that there's so much more going on when a fish shows up than just being able to feed that specific fish. I learned that the importance of having a well-oiled crew and team and that the second you don't start you don't hold up all of your weight, the team's not going to perform at its best, and in turn, it's going to fail. 
Costa Rica was just an incredible experience for me. I lived there full time for four years. And uh, before we took the boat up to Baja, California to fish the Mags Bay Stripe Marlin Bite, that was in 2018, the 1800 mile journey up the coast of Central America and Mexico is really, um, it's challenging in a lot of ways. There's a lot of different parts of that crossing that need to be very, very closely reviewed. And um, it's, it's a difficult thing. We've now done it three times. This specific crossing is quite challenging because there's some really dangerous weather sections. The Papagayo and the Tawanapec are just two of the potential hazard zones along the 1800 mile crossing. Additionally, the more you check in and out of various countries, the more taxes you're in imports you're going to have to pay. So we did our best and have managed to do our best every time to only check in and out of Costa Rica and Mexico, which makes it a little bit challenging. There's also a lot of information based on all of the entrance ports that we go to, reasons why you should go to this one and not this one, depending on what the season is and what the weather and fuel prices are doing. So pretty proficient in it, but for the first time, I just remember my sun, my sunrise shifts with the dolphin every day the dolphins show up and, and dance along the bow and dance along the wake. And it was a pretty precious, precious experience for me. Then we went to mags and that in itself was magical. It's a difficult industry. It's a difficult fishery to get to. So um, there's not a lot of people to fish it, even though these days now it's two, 2024. Everybody seems everybody knows about it. And although it's called mags bay, the fishery It's not always along the bay. The bay's in Anchorage inside Baja, and sometimes the striped marlin are outside of it, and sometimes they're not. The first year, they were actually north of Mags, about 200 miles from the marina in Cabo San Lucas. This last year, because I fished it again this last year, they were south of Mags, quite a bit closer to Cabo, but still pretty far up there. Now, Mags Bay was special because I'd never seen anything like it. We were light tackle fishing like we did for sailfish with a little bit heavier line, but the same tackle. And these fish were fighting like marlin. They were lighter than the blue marlin. They were kind of less strong, but they went in all sorts of different directions. We learned early on that if you hook more than three, you're going to spend way too long fighting them. And it was um, it was special. I'd never seen anything like it. The the life out there, there's not, there's not a lot of development up that Baja coast, and it's pretty desolate in terms of humanity, which makes it a very, very wild space and why I was so drawn to it because it's absolutely stunning. There were sea lions dancing in our wake. There were whales. We saw orcas jump in unison across the spread one day, and that was insane. I swear it looked like something from SeaWorld, except they were healthy and happy, and I was a little concerned for my safety. You know, a sport fishing boat kind of looks like an iceberg, and I, you know, I don't know. I kind of feel like I look like a sea lion sometimes. (laughs) There's that. Anyway, it was really cool. The striped marlin fishery was was unrivaled. There's a lot of people that say that that fishery is getting overpromoted. I think that that's not necessarily the case. I know that there's more money being put into studying these striped marlin. And my opinion is that uh, the government is starting to recognize that these fish are worth more alive than dead because there's a lot of dollars going into the communities so that people, so that recreational anglers can go catch and release these striped marlin. So I believe in just basic environmental economics that this is going to lead to proper management and conservation just because these studies studies are being proposed and and carried out, which I think is really, really cool. For Max, we went back down to Costa Rica and set up for our big crossing because the boat owner had decided that he wanted to go over to Madeira in search for the grander blue marlin. Now, if you know anything about fishing, you know that a grander is a big deal in the sport fishing space. There's not a lot of fish that are caught over 1,000 pounds. The blue marlin grander is a huge accomplishment for any fisherman, and a lot of people fish their entire lives in search for one. So we took the boat back down to Panama City, 
through the Panama Canal for the second time and up the eastern seaboard to Georgia. We stopped in Florida and got all of the work done to prepare the boat for European power and all of the logistics that come to play when you take your boat from the U.S. to the eastern Atlantic. From Savannah, we boarded a ship and took the boat over to Gran Canaria, the Canary Islands. The Canaries are owned by Spain, but they're off the coast of Western Africa. We ended up staying in the Canaries for three years. The pandemic hit and it was a bit sloppy. I was locked inside for three months, you guys. I was locked inside for three months. I was allowed to go to the grocery store and a pharmacy by myself. And they were they were printing out specific receipts with timestamps so that the Guarda Civil, who were, if you know anything about the Spanish government, you know that it was a fascist country until the late 80s. And when the Guarda Civil patrol the streets, you don't mess around. So they were checking our receipts to make sure that we had just, in fact, left the grocery store and were going straight home. It was very, very strict. It was very hard to go through. And I'm uh, it was an interesting experience, but we got out of there. We rallied up and we finally made it up to Madeira in the summer of 2021. Now, the Eastern Atlantic was the first time that I ever was given the actual opportunity to pursue professional status on the boat. It was the first time that I was able to help rig tackle, help rig baits, and help work the cockpit. Drake and I were the full-time crew on board, and we had a hired hand, Andy Holen, join us in Madeira for the season, and I learned a lot from him. I was still cooking and cleaning inside, but with the three of us on board, the work was, was split pretty evenly. Madeira was an incredibly beautiful place. I had never seen anything like it. There's water that just pours out of that island, and the fishery was also pretty crazy. You are dropping your lures out as you leave the marina. It's all very, very steep there, and therefore the fishing grounds are just off the coast. You never lose cell phone service. Now, 2021 was a slow year. We ended up with 10 releases. We were pulling a dynamic spread. We had lures in the longs and hookless teasers in the shorts. The idea was to bring the fish in and get a circle hook with a pitched bait, but we didn't want to potentially miss the fish, so we were making sure we had lures with J-hooks in the back. We also often were pulling a shotgun, which is where we caught a very big spearfish that ended up being absolutely delicious. <laughs> we harvested that one. We'd heard that the meat was really good and it did not disappoint. Now, if you know, um, there are three different types of species of spearfish. No, actually four. There's four different types of species of spearfish. There's the longbill spearfish, the shortbill spearfish, which you see in the Pacific, the Mediterranean spearfish, and the round scale spearfish, which is also known as a hatchet marlin, which was only recently discovered because a lot of people think that they're white marlin. In fact, that species wasn't actually discovered until a collaboration between science labs and recreational fishermen outlined the differentiations between the species during the mid-Atlantic fishing tournament not very long ago. That's going to be a really interesting conversation for another time. So, Four different species of spearfish. We caught one of them. It was absolutely delicious. And Madeira is also where we caught our biggest fish to date, an 850-pound blue marlin. She was absolutely blue, beautiful. We um, made sure to revive her, oxygenate her, and let her go on her merry way. And um, we never caught the grander. We never caught that 1,000-pounder. But we decided in Madeira that we were going to go down to Cape Verde and spend some time there in search for her. It didn't help that the that a grander Marlin won the World Cup that year in Cape Verde. That's where she was. From Madeira, we went back south to the island of La Gomera, where Drake and I were living and held residency. La Gomera is a really cool island in the Canaries. It's a place that we'll always call home. It's got a special part of our hearts, even though we were locked inside there. There's an incredible bluefin, giant bluefin fishery there, and we ended up fishing that season. Now, we were fishing 130s in Madeira, which was the heaviest tackle. Well, it is the heaviest tackle that you can fish IGFA legally, but it's the heaviest tackle I'd ever fished. It was the first time I fished 130. And then we went down to uh, Gomera and fished for bluefin tuna, giant bluefin tuna. I'm talking anywhere from six to 800 pound fish plus. Um, these fish are really, really big. The commercial, Spanish commercial fleet really 
goes after them. The recreational fleet doesn't have the ability to harvest fish, but um, the catch and release industry is still is still really good there. And that was my first time that I got to step up as a professional in the mate. I was running the cockpit by myself. Every bit of tackle um, that was put behind the boat, I had rigged personally and not a single piece failed. That was a big accomplishment for me. And we ended up actually tying the canary and release record with eight giant bluefin in a single day. We had a friend, Tessie, a local mate, um, a local guy that was helping us wiring the fish because these guys, these fish were really huge and we did need an extra hand, but the operation in the cockpit was mine. And that was an incredible accomplishment for me and something that I truly hold dear. Because whereas I had maybe had doubts of my proficiency and my ability to run a cockpit, doubts that were often reinforced by others. Lago Mara showed me that those doubts were, weren't real and that I really could make it happen. Also in Lago Mara, we had the opportunity with quite a bit of downtime to fish with new friends that we had made there. And I became pretty proficient in the chair as a heavy tackle angler. I had never fished heavy tackle before going over to the Eastern Atlantic and definitely never fished out of a chair. And for every marlin we caught in Madeira, I was I was not the angler. But um, getting to fish these bluefin out of the chair was an extremely educational experience. When you're attached to a giant, massive tuna, they're so strong with 75 pounds of drag on the reel. You learn really quick what works and what doesn't. And uh, that combined with uh, the, the education in Madeira as well as countless conversations I had with my good friend Kelly Dowling Fallon who has fished 19 full seasons on the Great Barrier Reef for giant black marlin in Australia. I combined combined with all those things, I've I managed to learn a lot, and I call myself a pretty darn proficient heavy tackled chair angler as well. Another super cool th- part about our time in Lago Mera was our collaboration with the Tag a Giant Foundation. Uh, We had a group from uh, Marine Hopkins Science Institute at Stanford University coming over to satellite tag giant bluefin tuna, and we were helping them do that. That was so educational and so awesome. And in fact, my next episode is going to be me sitting down with Chloe Michaels, a PhD candidate studying bluefin tuna over at at Stanford. And I'm really excited about that one. You're not going to want to miss it. From Gomera, we were supposed to take the boat down 800 miles to Cape Verde, but the boss ended up pulling the plug and asking us to bring the boat back to Texas, where she had been gone for an entire decade, and putting her up for sale. That was a new chapter for us, so we never got to go do Cape Verde, and one day I... I definitely will. It's high on my bucket list. But the boat went up for sale and Drake and I were snatched up pretty quickly by a different operation. Magnifico Sport Fishing is a 60 Spencer run out of Port Aransas, Texas. And I was apprehensive of whether or not I wanted to continue working full time on an offshore vessel. I was offered the position as first mate, but decided instead to sign a three month contract helping Drake outfit the boat for tournaments and international travel while he looked for a full time crew and I went on my own way to start my own media business. Now, this was a really difficult decision for me because I was given the opportunity to be first mate aboard a what would become a competitive fishing team. It was something I'd ar- always wanted, but I decided to go and pursue something that could turn into maybe something a little bit bigger. I took on a contract with the Sport Fishing Championship Series, which is a televised series on CBS Sports. We cover bill fishing tournaments along the Gulf of Mexico and Eastern Seaboard, as well as into the Caribbean. And I worked as an on-site broadcaster for these tournaments. That was an educational experience, to say the least, because I have a passion for educating people about the offshore fishery. I feel strongly that the more people know, the better better we can protect and conserve our fisheries for the long term, which is why I'm sitting with you today on this podcast. I've decided to launch multiple educational platforms from SFC to my own personal podcast channel and some exciting projects that are coming your way soon. So definitely stay posted for that. I also work as a freelance mate and coach and took a job on Magnifico for three months this last fall in the Mags Bay fishery. 
I was working to fine tune a tournament team in the cockpit and it went super well. So we know I'm super interested in fishing, that I've spent a lot of time on an offshore fishing boat and living and working full time on an offshore fishing boat. Goodness, those were seven years of just unrivaled experience. So that's a synopsis into my professional background, but something I really enjoy doing as well is spearfishing. I am a certified freediver. I absolutely love being under the water, and that's definitely something we're going to be having some conversations about moving forward. Additionally, I became trained by the Ikejime Federation in the Art of Ikejime, which is a Japanese method of harvesting fish that creates a biochemically superior fish meat product. I have a lot of educational content on how recreational anglers can take their fish harvests and maximize the quality of the meat used out of respect for themselves, their families, and the life they harvest. Relative to that note, I've become very passionate about hunting and harvesting my own land meat as well. Land meat, is that something you say? That's something I'm gonna say. The land meat is delicious and it's often red. I harvest my own land meat as well. The first deer I ever shot was with a 243 that was gifted to me by my darling husband after I defended my dissertation for my master's degree. Now, this doe, um, it was a hard, it was a hard kill for me because, uh, it was just a hard kill for me. It was by far the uh, biggest animal I'd shot. It was the first non-bird, non-fish species that I harvested. And um, although I never once regretted it, it definitely broke my heart. I spent a good uh, couple minutes crying after the kill. And from that moment on, I realized that it was extremely important for me to make sure that that animal was cared for properly and utilized to its fullest potential. So out of respect of my kill, out of respect of that animal, it was my hands that skinned it. It was my hands that gutted it. I butchered it. I processed it. I packaged it. I prepared it and I cooked it and fed it to my family and friends. And that kind of came full circle in a lot of ways in my values and I realized that even though I grew up with kind of an outlandish view of hunting I realized that being able to do this being able to harvest my own meat has brought me closer to nature and as a result closer to myself as an individual so I've developed a, a passion for hunting I actually have spent the last two hunting seasons, hunting public lands, archery in South Texas. The Aransas National Wildlife Refuge is one of the known uh, most challenging hunts in South Texas, not be <laughs> just because it's so terribly miserable, but um, it's nothing like some of the hunts you see in other parts of the country. In fact, this Coming September, I have been drawn for a public lands archery elk hunt in Idaho. I am totally unprepared for that, and I'm really excited about it. I'm going to be doing that with a dear friend from university and her husband, and I'm really excited to get up to Idaho. I've never spent time up there and uh, see what, what it means to public lands elk hunt. So you can definitely expect some conversations about that genre as well. Now, everything that I have done, every passion I've pursued, from being a competitive angler in a tournament series to working my way up to being a professional mate in the cockpit, from hunting after giant tuna, dogtooth, yellowfin, big eye, and wahoo underwater to educating myself in the best ways to consume, prepare, and harvest meat. Every part of that has been to connect myself to nature in a way that I can't do otherwise. I believe that there's a severe disconnect between man and meat and man and nature and that we have grown to separate ourselves mentally and physically from our natural world. I believe that we can't truly protect something until we love it. We can't love something until we understand it and we can't understand something until we're curious about it. This is why I have a passion for sharing my experiences and helping people reconnect with nature in their own way. You can expect a lot of interesting conversations on a wide variety of topics on this podcast, but one thing will be certain. Every conversation will revolve around a mutual love and respect of the wild, of nature, the outdoors, and everything it has to offer. And there you have it. This is the KDC Sawyer Podcast. We'll see you out there. And as always, don't stop chasing your wild.